And there's a reason we're in a tough finance situation. <laughs> People, like I say, the psychopaths ruling the national government, they don't care. They'll spend money. I mean, $28 trillion in debt and moving even more. I mean, if that's insanity. And having China as one of your biggest people you owe money to and stuff like that. I mean, I, I will say this. I know a lot of people who have given up and they say there's really no hope for us. And when you see that 2030 video, you see the military basically saying there's not a lot of hope. The country's going to crash and that you're going to see a global crash. So a lot of people are just saying, just obey. But if you look back at Jefferson, Madison, people like that, they didn't just obey. They were willing to put their lives on the line for freedom. And that's what, you know, again, uh, I tell people that, you know, it's are you willing to stay in the battle and fight to the end? And that's that's the only way we're going to save freedom out there. This is Donegan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver dealer with Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized, private service from one of the oldest and best respected companies in the business. 30 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded, insured delivery or vault storage or IRAs, excellent prices, privacy and confidentiality, pay by check, money order, ACH or wire, satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest. John Whitehead is the founder of the Rutherford Institute. He's also the author of the book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People. He joins us this Monday, April 26th, 2021. John, thanks for coming back on. Hey, thanks for having me on, sir. We wanted to have you back on after you penned a recent commentary article called Financial Tyranny Footing the Tax Bill for the Government's Fiscal Insanity. And I just wanted to read one sentence or two from the conclusion of that article to give people a little taste for it. The Constitution starts with those three powerful words, we the people. As I make clear in my book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, there is power in our numbers that remains our greatest strength in the face of a government elite that continues to ride roughshod over the populace. It remains our greatest defense against a government that has claimed for itself unlimited power over the purse, taxpayer funds, and the sword, military might. So, John, you are a constitutional attorney. You have argued cases on behalf of people and their freedoms and their liberties and their rights and the Constitution all the way up to and including the U.S. Supreme Court. You've taken on many fronts, First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights, Fourth Amendment rights, on and on. In this particular article that you wrote about financial tyranny, you focused, first of all, on the unprecedented level and scale, the scope and scale that has gone out of control of the amount of our earnings that are basically taken, co-opted by the government before we, we ever get our hands on our, on our earnings, and then what they're doing with them to further limit our, our freedoms. So could you kind of hit us with what you believe to be the most important points that you are bringing forward in your article, Financial Tyranny, Footing the Tax Bill for the Government's Fiscal Insanity? Yes, and people can read the uh, article at Rutherford.org, and I would suggest that they go do that. So, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video, folks. You can go to the description. You'll find the link to that article. And I footnote what I say, so it's not conspiracy theories. Um, well, uh, you know, the national debt's at $28 trillion and growing. That's $224,000 per taxpayer. Um, we're overtaxed, as any, any American knows, uh, and... Um, you know, the government does whatever it wants to do. And one reason it does that is uh, there was a Princeton study, by the way, of 20 years of laws passed in Washington, D.C., uh, with Northwestern University by, by a group of professors. They came to the conclusion that the United States government's run by an oligarchic elite, as they called it. And whenever they said a controversy comes up, that they actually say this, the taxpayer always loses. And what they came to the conclusion was is that we are ruled by 585 billionaires, essentially, who run the government. And we can get into a little more detail how they're doing that. But 
Uh, the, the United States government is not a government of, of we the people. They don't see it that way. It's run by people who have a, a lot of money. They want to make more money. Um, when you have the military industrial complex, I call it the military corporation complex, uh, they have a $675 billion defense budget dropping a bomb every 12 minutes in different countries and bases all over the world. And, um, no limit on the spending, how they spend it or whatever. Uh, Congress just willy-nilly gives over. But again, if, if I've uh, researched it, I'm a former military officer, by the way, but I've had a number of high-ranking off military officers who have talked to me about their concerns of what they see in the military, how the money's being spent, and what we're doing in some of those foreign countries. In fact, I had one, an Air Force pilot, who was a high-ranking pilot and uh, graduated from the Air Force Academy, and he uh, talked to me. He actually came into my office and sat down and talked to me one time. He said he had read my books and stuff and said he was shocked. He finally he loved the military, but he had to get out when he discovered that the military was actually guarding the opium fields in places like Afghanistan and actually helping harvest it. He said that shocked me. The American taxpayer is paying for this. Where's this money going? And that's a good question to ask. Where's this money going? We really don't know. And uh, – it's that's the kind of things we're up against uh, continually, and with the you know all the money spent now on COVID vaccines, and now <clears throat> the government's announced they're, they're dispersing fact vaccines to 50 countries. But here's the question I want to ask people: we, Do we ever get to vote on any of this stuff? Do we, <laughs> how do we vote? On, we vote for what's his name to go to Congress, but once once his name gets up there, uh, once his name becomes a millionaire, maybe soon a billionaire, who knows? and gets in the government, and they make a lot of money. Your average congressman, by the way, spends about three days a week in phone booths raising money for the next campaign. I actually had a uh, former friend of mine who was writing for a top magazine. I can't say which one because it might out him, but he was working for a senator, and he called me and said, John, your next book sh should be the evil corporations. He said they run everything in Washington, D.C. And this is a very good reporter, by the way, who did a lot of good, has done a lot of good things and still does. But – he saw it. And he said, I'm not working for this senator anymore. I'm going back to being a journalist. And that's what he does today. But the point is, uh, being in and out of Washington, D.C., I've sued in another 40 years. I've seen it. There was another important study done by uh, an SMU professor, Ryan Murphy. Uh, he studied basically where psychopathology congregated in the United States. After a detailed study, he came to the conclusion it was Washington, D.C. <laughs> and if you know what psychopaths are, the people who they can be quite you know, charismatic and all that, but they have no morals and they don't care about, they care about one thing themselves and how they can uh, ingratiate themselves. And so we're seeing that basically with most of the politicians I've run into in Washington, DC, I'm shocked. I mean, I've known some of them personally, a few presidents, by the way, and I'm shocked at what happens to them once they get into power and uh, it's all run by money. And so that's what we're seeing. And, you know, when you have a, uh, uh, 60 of the top 500 corporations in America don't pay taxes. But you and I pay them, don't we? Dunnigan, you pay taxes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But they're not paying taxes. And uh, they work for the government, by the way. We're in a corporate state. I keep trying to convince people that if you do the research, you'll see it very clearly. When you have Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, et cetera, more uh, corporations getting paid billions of dollars to create, the intelligence cloud for all 17 intelligence agencies and maintain it, which they do. They have access to all that information the government has, which is everything, by the way. Our whole lives are now are tracked, phone conversations, emails, text messages, and everything. Uh, when you have those people uh, getting paid billions of dollars and working with the government, we've, we've moved into a corporate state and, uh, that, that's one of the big things I see. We're seeing people who are there for one thing. John Carpenter, the director, who's done some really good movies, by the way. They're kind of weird. But uh, uh, he said he had realized it in his con when he had worked in and out of some with some politicians that all they want is our money. That's the only thing they're having. And his movie, They Live, kind of postulates that idea that there's a secret kind of shadow government, which is now being called the deep state, by the way. We've all heard that. And the deep state, whether somebody's blabbing that doesn't exist, 
I'm telling you folks, from what I've seen in Washington, D.C. and all my research over 30 books, the deep state does exist. And it's there for one thing, to maintain its power, to increase its wealth. When you have the top 12 billionaires in America increasing, the 12th richest men in America increasing their wealth uh, by 380 some billion dollars during this COVID disaster, you gotta think about that. Why wouldn't they donate some of that money back to we the people and say, hey, let's get somebody up there in control and start controlling Congress, have some morality, but they don't. They work with the people in government, the so-called politicians, which is what they are. And uh, I keep telling people, don't be fooled by all this. And as you read the uh, part of my commentary, we the people can be very, very powerful. We pay the bill for all these things we're seeing. So why can't we say, I don't want that anymore? I don't want the 80,000 SWAT team raids that are occurring in America where kids, up to 500 dogs a day get shot uh, by cops smashing through somebody's door in the middle of the night, violating the Fourth Amendment. And some of the things we're seeing across the country, asset forfeiture, where people are pulled over, cops are seizing cash out of their cars, sometimes their cars, they're actually seizing people's homes, and people have to go into court to fight to get them back, and many people can't afford to do that. That's called asset forfeiture, and that money is split between the U.S. Justice Department and local police. They're making a lot of money. That's what I'm saying. So government is there to make money, and if we don't see that, uh, and one way to freak them out is to say, hmm, we're going to restrict that, and here's how we're going to do it, and start fighting back. Now, in your article, you spent maybe the first third or so of your article talking about the unconstitutional roots of this problem. Can you take us just briefly, maybe in a fast forward, through what, how we started out as a country, what, what is supposed to be um, the basis of what turned into financial tyranny? Where did that, where did that root of that weed uh, come out? Well, basically, oh, that weed, that's a good one, <laughs> that's a bad weed, uh, came out, uh, was uh, through the, you know, the imposition of uh, income tax in 1930. 1913, you got to realize that the country was basically founded in 1776, 17 and 80s when the Constitution was finished, and it took uh, about 100, what, 50 years, 140 years for them to impose an income tax on all the people, and once they did that, it was over. In other words, but the way it was sold, it wasn't, wasn't going to be all the people, right? What's that? The way that it was sold was it oh, wasn't no. going to be on all the people. No, but it definitely was uh, implemented to get your money. And that was basically it. You work hard. I mean, there are so many people out there that I, average people that I help, the Rough Institute defends people who can't afford a lawyer, essentially. And I see so many people that are getting their heads smashed here or whatever and like that. They can't afford lawyers. They're still paying taxes on everything. I mean, when you go into the store now, sales taxes, all the things we're seeing that you pay, it just bounces up to the point where you have to say, wow, I mean, a product that should be 10 cents is probably going to be five bucks because of all the taxes. So that's what we're seeing. And, uh, you know, with the way that, uh, I mean, people like, Dwight Eisenhower warned, he said, watch out for things like the military industrial complex. It will not only take your freedoms away, but it will wreak havoc on the economy. And that's what we're seeing, you know. A country that's $28 trillion in debt is a country that's going to collapse. And here's, here's another thing, just kind of strange, I think. Our biggest two debt holders in the United States is Japan and China. China is a total surveillance state that puts people in concentration camps that lock them up for saying the wrong word, have social credit scores, so they can't travel, do anything like this if they say they don't like the government. We're in debt to a government like that. Uh, you have to be concerned because whoever is the big debt holders, as you know, Dunnigan, anybody out there that owes a lot of money to somebody, they can pretty, pretty much call the shots sometimes the way they want to go. And then you have people like Google working with the military industrial uh, corporation, cor corporate state, to do their intelligence cloud. And Google works with the Chinese government as well with their surveillance state. So we, I'd say education precedes action. Most Americans are not educated on any of these issues. And trying to get them educated is very, very difficult getting them to set and read because we're in what I would call a narcissistic culture. We're addicted to our cell phones and screen devices. And 
It's like narcissists looking into the pool. We see sort of, oh, that's wonderful. You get kids today just staring at it. And here's the thing I warn people about is those devices and your screen devices and all that. That's Facebook and Google and companies like that and Amazon that work with who? Did I say it? CIA, NSA, FBI, and groups like that who are doing total surveillance on us. How do you can control a populace? How can you make a populace not think? By getting them to stare. The average American watches 150 hours of screen devices a month. I'm going, whoa. How do we how do we break away from all this? I don't know. I think we're, we're a society in change is what I would call it, basically, right now. And the chains are there. It's financial chains. It's all the screen devices. It's mainstream media, which we now know the number of articles are broken recently, how the CIA works intimately with the mainstream media. And I knew that before because Carl Bernstein of Bernstein and Woodward, uh, the Nixon years, the great journalist, came out with an article, I think it was in 1977, where he said he was shocked when he started working with the major media, found it was from the CIA and the same stuff were sitting in their offices. So what I'm saying is uh, what the great leader – uh, a good thinker, James Madison, who wrote our Bill of Rights, which most people don't know what that is uh, today when I talk to him, even lawyers, said we ought to mistrust all those in power. Once you start trusting people in power, you become very foolish. Once they get money, how many people have you ever known, I ask people, who once they get a lot of money or something, become different people, get in power, they change, they start looking at themselves in a mirror and say, I'm cool or I'm awesome. And, but as I say, we're all the same people. We have two legs, two feet, ten fingers, unless they cut them off, and stuff like that. So that's the situation we find ourselves in. And trying to get uh, people to wake up to that situation is awful. And here's another thing I'm warning people. Uh, the country could collapse financially. There was a, the intercept, I think it was the intercept, that leaked a video about four or five years ago that was uh, developed by the Pentagon. It's the 2030 video, it's called. It was done by a Hollywood director who remains anonymous, but it looked very much like a Steven Spielberg futuristic film. But it predicts that by 2030, the country or before that is totally going to collapse and they're going to have to implement martial law. When people say, how come the cops have grenade launchers, MRAPs, military equipment now, the local police, I mean, they they are they look like the military and they act like the military. Uh, why do they have all that equipment? Why is the Department of Homeland Security spending billions of dollars spreading that stuff out? I mean, they 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 basically told us a lie in the beginning uh, when they said that they, that was donated military equipment. I did my research and found out at least fifty percent was brand new. So some big corporations making a lot of money, many corporations of all that military equipment, to police, and then you have uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, purchase. Uh, having a corporation making 1.6 million hollow point bullets, especially for their 175,000 agents that, that track all over the country. So they're ready for anything that could happen, a collapse. That's why I'm telling you, I, when I have people contact me and say, I'm getting my gun, you know, and I'm getting my fellow gun boys again, and we're going to go out. And I said, well, <laughs> dude, do you have a grenade launcher? Do you have an MRAP, which is a tank on tires? I said, what do you have? You have armor, you know, the helmets? And they go, no. I said, you're going to run up against that with your rifle, or your pistol? You ain't going to do it, man. And uh, so we, we need some uh, better strategy. Strategies I lay out in my books and on our website. But it's, first of all, people have to wake up. Like I say, education precedes action without it. Watching your program here and others. And then learning your Bill of Rights, teaching your kids the Bill of Rights because they don't <clears throat> learn them very well in school anymore. They don't know them. I mean, I talk to lawyers who can't tell me what's in the First Amendment anymore. Young lawyers. I want to underscore a few things that you hit uh, in rapid succession there. You mentioned the question. People still question, is there, is there a deep state? What is that? I think we've seen in the last administration what happens when someone tries to run up against, quote unquote, draining the swamp and ends up getting, um, you know, basically made ineffective through all of the, the stonewalling and everything, and, and frankly, uh, deception and betrayal, as, as James Rawls puts it. We met, went to the Ron Paul Institute uh, Peace and Prosperity Conference in Washington, D.C. a few years back and heard testimony from multiple congressmen uh, talking about and, and 
ranking uh, military as well, retired, talking about running up against deep state and what they're, what, how that's affecting the ability to make any change in, in Washington. You mentioned that 2030 training video. We'll include a link to that in the uh, description of this video so that people can take a look at it. One of the things that you, you focused there on the end was militarization of the police, but that's in contrast to, in stark contrast to the disarming of the U.S. people, the, their Second Amendment rights. We have a constitutional attorney as well, uh, Dr. Edwin Vieira, on intermittently, and he talks to us about the, the constitutional intention that all the 13 original colonies had and the United States had when it was formed and is in our Constitution, saying that we do need a citizen militia. That was that was what every every one of the colonies had, but that's... Uh, arming the citizens in such a way that they have compatible level of, of firepower to infantry soldiers so that they can resist threats foreign and domestic. So can you talk to us a little bit about the disparity that we went from a citizen militia able to defend against threats foreign and domestic to a basically passive and, and now soon perhaps to be disarmed uh, citizenry facing these increasingly military, militarized local and state and federal police? Well, through the education system now, uh, the public education system especially, uh, uh, the fear of guns. I mean, kids uh, in uh, many public schools are not allowed to mention the word gun, by the way. I, I've been told that. And I've asked a few of them, how, do, how does your teacher explain what they carry in Afghanistan, how they, can, how they uh, describe what a police officer carry? And the one said, well, you can only use the word G. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> so they're carrying Gs but not guns. And there's a great fear of guns now and all that, except with the police. The police can have them, and people there are saying the police are going to protect us and all that. But like I say, they're not really doing that so much. I mean, there are really good police officers out there who talk to me, and they're frightened about what's going on in police departments across the country, how they view the American people as enemy combatants. And that's a real problem there. And um, so uh, – you know, it's the Second Amendment rights were essential to the people who wrote the Constitution. That's why you have a Second Amendment. It was clear the right to bear arms is going, it's something that can't be limited uh, to the people. I mean, you're going to have uh, people who go crazy and do things, and there are going to be mass shootings occasionally here or there or whatever. But if you look how many people are shot by a government agency each year, that's up to fourteen or 1,500 people, uh, and not many people talk about that. And so it's uh, how do you defend yourself in a country that's armed by police officers like that? I mean, it's but again, I'm, I'm warning people. It's very difficult because here's what we were snoring asleep while the government, federal government, armed local police like the military. They are extensions of the military now, the warrior cop, as they call them. And they're, not all cops are bad. Like I say, I've worked with police chief. In fact, I had a police chief call me a couple of years ago, and he said, John, I'm going to really limit my SWAT team raids. And I said, why are you doing that? He said, I used to be skeptical of your stuff. But what he said, believe it or not, we did a SWAT team raid in our local community, and one of my police officers put an AK-47 rifle to a four-year-old kid's head. We had to knock it away. And they get hyped up on that power. Once you get that black outfit on, by the way, the, the black is the – symbol of power. The blue uniforms, the brown uniforms are gone. The friendly uniforms, the black ones are Darth Vader, power, crush. And I mean, local communities, that's the only way I see any hope in America today. Washington, D.C. is very, very corrupt. It's not going to do much, folks. I mean, you can say I voted for this, I voted for that guy. If you think voting is the thing, the best thing you can do, you're delusional. The best thing you can do is participate in government. Get down to your local city council, pass some laws, sending the military equipment back. Few communities have done that. One community in New Mexico has done that. You can do that. And it's going to, I mean, the local governments are going to resist it because they get money too. Watch out. A lot of your local governments, the corporation, the big companies go down and take them out to trips and stuff like that. I mean, it should outrage American citizens that presidents go golfing. <laughs> How many days a year? I forget. So many. They're out golfing and playing golf and doing this and going to big clubs and drinking martinis while we're working our butts off so that they can fly to play golf. I mean, they should be there to serve us. And that's why I keep telling people there are supposedly our public servants. We are the masters. Get that in your head. Get it in your kid's head and start looking down and saying, okay, do your job correctly or we're going to remove this. 
and reduce the taxes in your local community. Don't let asset forfeiture be an item in your community. Get do away with that. The Tenth Amendment allows local governments to nullify the federal government. Tenth Amendment. Now we've seen a number of actions by governors in different states and legislatures of different states that are now standing up for constitutional saying certain executive orders that are coming out of Washington are not going to be enforceable in like their state. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's a good thing. Uh, we have two questions from viewers that are related here. William Mueller says, do you think free red states should and will secede? And if so, how will these dominoes start to fall? We have another one from Black Oak Property Maintenance who says, I would like to hear that question asked also. How does this get started? I see the governor of Montana has outlawed vaccine passports. Now he's basically nullified executive orders regarding gun laws. Is this the beginning of Montana looking for a dance partner to check out of the union? So what do you think of that overall phenomenon, first of all, in broad terms of states standing up for the rights of people in the face of overreach from Washington. The 10th Amendment allows it. It allows the uh, local governments, the states, to nullify acts of Congress. And uh, I keep, t- you know, again, most people don't realize that. We have that power as a people and a government. I think those are good movements. It's saying, no, it's looking at Washington D and saying, no, we're not going to follow your corruption anymore. And um, I think, I mean, it's, it's good. The 10th Amendment allows it. Uh, we should be teaching it throughout the country. I'm trying to teach it, teach it in the schools, in your local school, by the way. Start teaching your kids the Bill of Rights, things like that, the Second Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, and all those things. And the, you can start changing things. There's only uh, a reason you have that happening in a few states. I think it's like Arkansas has done the same thing uh, on the Second Amendment. It's because they realize, hey, I have this power. I can do it, and nobody wants this stuff being shoved down our throat. And once they take the guns away, folks, all you're going to have is that militarized police unit or the National Guard's working more and more closely with local police. They're dressing in military gear with the camouflage outfits. It's getting pretty scary out there. So without local action, I don't see any hope for this country. You don't expect it to come out of Washington, D.C. Don't expect some president, like you said. If the president does something the deep state doesn't like, they're going to punch him a little bit. Maybe kick him out, move him on. Yeah, we certainly saw a lot of that in the last several years. Now, you've talked about uh, some of these overreach of, a, of a force and authority. What about the financial oppression that you talked about in your most recent article that we were refer- referencing earlier? What actions do you see that people can take? Because you mentioned in your article that we're, we're past a tipping point where now instead of like the government taking a minority portion of your income, now they get the first cut and yep. it becomes it's, it's running out of control. You mentioned the runaway uh, debting and expansion of the currency and the debt in the, during the COVID years. What kind of actions do you advise that people can do individually or together in the face of that financial overreach? Well, the only thing you can do is you can have local governments uh, say, no, we're not going to do this. You know, uh, we're going to stop uh, this type of taxation on our people. Uh, and you're going to get, you know, like I say, they're going to come back hard because money will be the one thing that they will try to crack your head over. Um, we're going to have to start some places. And I think uh, where, where we start is with uh, the gun control thing we're seeing now, which is can be very, very dangerous. The asset forfeiture where they're taking people's homes and cars and things like that. Get a priority list and uh, then try to get different uh, governments together, uh, people that have the same kind of mentality, and uh, start taking some action against Washington, D.C., even if it takes the form of a march or whatever, or lawsuits. Lawsuits can be filed. Groups like us would be interested in looking at stuff like that. And uh, that's it. It's going to take their, – their, one thing that bothers them is if the we, the people, get organized together. And one thing I'm seeing with all this stuff we're seeing now uh, with racial divide, political divide, all that stuff, divide and conquer works. As long as they can keep us in each other's faith, they win. Get together, folks, and stop all this stuff. Turn away from each other and look at the government up in Washington, D.C., and your state government sometimes can be very corrupt. And get get up there and get active and uh, get some people out there who act, will run for office who you th- hopefully have the right views to begin with and will enforce those views when they get in government. Now, you mentioned you didn't draw the connection, so I'll ask you about that. You mentioned that the 
the root of the weed of financial oppression, you draw back to 1913 with the formation of the federal income tax. The same year, 1913, was when the Federal Reserve started and we had a central bank and fiat currency that came from it. We have a question from Pete Ausby who says, the Bible mandates a just weights and measure financial system. So in other words, morality, ethics is based on not depriving the working man of his wages, of his just wages. But the Constitution mandates an unjust way to measure financial system via legal tender laws. And again, since 1913, we've had the, the fiat currency and, and runaway debt and so on. What do you see as ways that we can turn the corner back to just, uh, just financial system and just currency, uh, sound money for people? If you can get rid of the Federal Reserve, that'd be great. But like I say... Um, people have to realize this. We are ruled by a corporate state. Uh, as the professors found out at uh, Princeton and Northwestern University, their study, that we're ruled by about 585 billionaires who run everything. Uh, we've got to, uh, the only hope I see in this country is, and I'll go back and say it again, is Washington, D.C. is not going to do much at all to help us. They'll only get nervous if local government starts saying, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to enforce this. We're not going to enforce this. We'll protect our citizens against your IRS raids, by the way, mm -hmm. or someone out there. You can't object. But again, the Federal Reserve is a scary thing. When you have people out there, you don't know, <laughs> private bankers or whatever, corporate yeah. matters running things. Well, it's, just, it's what we're saying. We're ruled by people with money and they don't care. And uh, as one fellow in the Bible said named Jesus, the root of all evil is the love of money. And um, once that happens, you know, once you're ruled by money, you're going to be ruled by people who are dictators. And it should, like I say, outrage Americans that companies like Google, who do total surveillance on us, by the way, actually work with the Chinese government. I mean, that should scare you. Federal Reserve should scare you. All the things we're seeing. And But the only hope I see, and again, the founding fathers of the country saw it, it was local government saying no. That's why we have the 10th Amendment. They got together in groups and political bodies, looked at the political body in D.C. and said no. Uh, right. So there was a strong concern on the parts of the founders of our of our nation that they did they wanted to withhold. In fact, what it says, any right specifically, any power not specifically enumerated in the Constitution is we with is held back we by the, the states. People. Yeah. yeah. And we the people are the masters. We pay the bill. I keep telling people that. It should outrage you that you're you I hear people objecting, I say, Well you're paying for it, you know, with what they're doing, you mm. know. And uh again, I don't see anybody limiting taxes or those kind of things. Nobody, I mean, they just don't do that to people in power. So the only way you're gonna get any kind of hope is uh, local governments taking action. Now, I wanted to press on that a little bit farther because if the local, whether it's at the county or the city or the or the state level, if they say no to this overreach of power from Washington or financial abuse from Washington, it seems, as you mentioned, one of the most likely sticks you get hit with from those in power is financially. They'll they'll say, oh, well, then we're going to withhold your your highway funds or your your yeah. block grants for your schools or whatever else, and it's a tough time because. Even before COVID, you had demographic problems and uh, financial bankruptcy problems in many, uh, you know, whether it's Illinois, California, New York, you had states and, and municipalities that were in serious financial trouble and most likely going to go begging to the government for a, to the federal government for a bailout. So at that time, trying to have your local states and everything stand up and stand up on their own two feet and say, for the good of our people, we're not going to take your your overreach anymore and even if you withdraw funding from us that's not we're not to be bought our freedoms are not to be bought it's a tough time is it not for many local areas to say that because they're oh, in yeah. such a tough financial situation and there's a reason we're in a tough financial situation <laughs> people like i say the psychopaths ruling the national government they don't care they'll spend money i mean 28 trillion dollars in debt and moving even more i mean if that's insanity and Having China as one of your biggest people you owe money to and stuff like that. I mean, I, I will say this. I know a lot of people who have given up, and they say there's really no hope for us. And when you see that 2030 video, you see the military basically saying there's not a lot of hope. The country's going to crash, and you're going to see a global crash. 
And here's the other thing I'm, I got to you know stress, and I see it, and I believe it. We're moving very quickly into a global government, by the way. And uh, with Google and the NSA has its Five Eyes program. They have bases around the world. They've completed a completely go- global environment now where they can watch wherever you go and uh, control whatever you do. So we're moving into a global, I say, digital state. And um, I think most kids coming out of school today and in the future are not going to realize what they're going to, they're just going to go, whoa, what is this? You know, this is the normal state of things, total control of everything I do. And what we're becoming is slaves, basically, and um, to the government. And I mean, listen, a slave is somebody who can't talk back, uh, doesn't have much money or doesn't have any money and go down the route, you know, and that's where a lot of American people find themselves today. Like I say, when you have the 80,000 SWAT team raids annually and growing, crashing through doors and killing people and dogs and kids, uh, I would say of all my years of uh, practice in law, this is the worst I've ever seen the government in the country. We're in a real deep doo-doo, folks. Another thing you just wrote about even more recently than the article on uh, financial overreach was about our our docility in the face of that that violent treatment by government, that the only way to survive is to be silent. Can you talk about that? We need to comply to live. Yeah, comply or die. That was the name of the article. Yeah, uh, and I hear uh, religious leaders and all people are just saying, just obey. But if you look back at Jefferson, Madison, people like that, they didn't just obey. They were willing to put their lives on the line for freedom. And that's what, you know, again, uh, I tell people that, you know, it's are you willing to stay in the battle and fight to the end? And that's that's the only way we're going to save freedom out there. And that means you have to get active, though. You have to get up off your butts, you know, move away from your screen devices as much as possible. Get involved in your local government and change things. That is the only hope I see us having. And if I had to say I believe that we have a lot of hope, I have to be honest with you, I don't think so. Because most people I run into are, you know, okay, I'll just do whatever they want me to do and I'll move on. And I'm saying, okay, well, that's what a slave does. A slave says, okay, I'll will do whatever you want me to do. And I'm saying don't do that. You know, uh, there are groups like us out there and a few other groups that will hopefully fight for your freedoms. And, I mean, there are a lot of private groups like churches and stuff today that if they got organized uh, and said, we're going to stop this stuff like the character in the Bible Jesus did. I mean, you may end up on the cross and are pushed around or find yourself in jail occasionally. But... uh, if there is a hereafter, I tell people, would you rather go there honestly or end up at, at somewhere and they're saying, hey, sorry, you can't come in here, buddy. <laughs> you, you sat on your butt all your life and didn't do anything. We're going to send you back through the process again, uh, whatever they call that. But, yeah, I think that if it's what kind of values do we have? You know, it's, it's is it the values we have that we love freedom and love government, you know? And I'm trying to teach that to young people. And again, that's one of the really keys. If you have children in your family, teach them the Bill of Rights, teach them freedom principles, uh, teach them how you can nonviolently change government, you know? And I just don't see any of that anymore. I see people wanting to go nutty and stuff and burn buildings. None of that works. The government loves, loves that, by the way. They, they send a militarized police and say, look at those idiots. You know, don't trust them. We interviewed Alex Newman from The New American, and he talks about the importance of educating your children, just as you said. And some people actually go to the extent to do homeschooling because then they, they yeah. take that out of the government's mm-hmm. hands. They say, we're not going to send our kids for indoctrination in the government school system. The other thing that uh, Jim Rawls from survivalblog.com, who we interviewed, talks about, we are living in the age of deception and betrayal, plan accordingly, invest accordingly, relocate accordingly. There is a trend of flight from what are referred to as blue states to red states. Basically, it's government and collectivist policy-loving states to individual and freedom and family and constitution-loving states. Do you foresee that trend to continue? And is that a factor that people can use to vote with their feet and go where they're treated better, where their constitutional liberties are upheld? 
Oh, yeah, I think it's good. You know, I won, by the way, I won the first homeschooling case in the United States back in 1979 when a father was arrested in the middle of the night for homeschooling his five kids. He called me up, didn't have any money, and I flew there, defended him for free, and won the case. Uh, it helps. It's basically helped start the homeschool movement. It was a real igniter. And uh, I always thought homeschooling was the way to go, teaching kids that uh, they do have freedom. They're, don't be afraid to say the word guns and crazy stuff like that. Be willing to stand up and challenge the government, those kind of things. Study some of these people who have been great Americans from the past who have done all these uh, neat things, you know. Uh, a Martin Luther King, by the way, who was not perfect, but – he was a great strategist. He said, hey, I'll use uh, nonviolence, and I'll be honest with you, I think he was shot through the head by the government. A hollow point bullet went through his head. Uh, he had planned to shut Washington, D.C. DC down. He was very organized. He had, he had field marshals he trained and stuff like that in nonviolence. They were going to sit in around the Capitol and block the government and not let people go in and out. They'd have to arrest all these people. And it was blacks and whites, by the way. It wasn't just one color. Uh, that kind of action, they fear. Once you have someone who speaks back against the government, like you were talking about the deep state, they can get quite violent, by the way. So uh, some of the people in the uh, John F. Kennedy's family believe that they've said it pretty clearly. We think the CIA killed John F. Kennedy, you know, uh, whether you want to call it the deep state or whatever. And that little things do happen. There are going to be setbacks, but – uh, I'm looking for that next great leader out there that, who can organize people like that. But I would think that if you could get an lo- organization together that would set up local government governments that agree and enforce the Tenth Amendment, uh, the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, and all those important things, the right to protest, mm-hmm. and implement them and get people involved. It's just like the father I defended in Michigan who wanted to be a homeschooling father. Um he got arrested in the middle of the night. He was willing to get arrested. I mean, that's what it takes. Are you willing to get arrested? I mean, have a criminal record for what? Homeschooling? Yeah, that's bad stuff. Well, a lot of us who are trying to provide uh, independent media voices out there to get this conversation and others aired, when people try to share the link, sometimes they get a, oh, this has been fact-checked to be false, and therefore, so people are getting gagged and silenced just trying to speak out, speaking of First Amendment rights. Yeah. So, but uh, we're, we're uh, staying firm, and we're continuing to try to get the word out there for people's freedom, for our liberty, and for upholding our financial freedom. If people want to find out more of your work, John, where should they get plugged in? You can go to Rutherford.org, Rutherford.org, and get the, read the weekly commentaries, follow us on Twitter, whatever. Um, my book, Battlefield America, has a good, strong action plan in the back of it, what I think people can do. Uh, like I said, education precedes action. Get your kids, your family involved, you know, and uh, make freedom fighters for the future. And, folks, if you want to lose track with us, make sure that you get on our free newsletter uh, email list. Go to libertyandfinance.com, put your name and address in the left-hand margin, click submit, make sure you get on our free, it's all free newsletter. You'll get John Whitehead's interviews, any links to articles that we're talking about with him and any of our guests. And that way, no matter what happens, as far as our uh, social media presence, you'll know how to find us because you'll get our email from libertyandfinance.com. John Whitehead, founder of the Rutherford Institute and author of Battlefield America, The War on the American People, Thank you for joining us again this time on Liberty and Finance. Thank you. This is Donegan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver dealer with Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized, private service from one of the oldest and best respected companies in the business. 30 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded, insured delivery or vault storage or IRAs, excellent prices, privacy and confidentiality, pay by check, money order, ACH or wire, satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com.